Hi again, everybody. We're going to talk about the parotid gland in this uh, lecture. And uh, I want to cover two topics, uh, the neoplasms that occur to the parotid gland, 80% of which are benign, but 20% are malignant. Uh, so those are going to be important to know about. And then some inflammatory issues uh, that can happen. Uh, one is inflammatory secondary to a cause, which is a stone in the gland, and another, which is uh, an actual infection. So uh, I, ter I, I termed this lecture the parotid gland, even though there are three salivary glands uh, on each side. Just because the parotid gland is the largest of the salivary glands, and that just happens to be where most of the neoplasms happen, and that's going to be uh, the most common problem that you see with the parotid gland. The parotid gland is on both sides. It is enclosed in a fascial sheath, and it covers the masseter muscle uh, deep to the vertical ramus of the mandible and up to the auditory meatus. It is drained into the mouth via Stenson's duct, and uh, it drains roughly uh, above the uh, uh, second molar. So, uh, that's the second upper molar, uh, the uh, maxillary molar. It receives innervation from the glossopharyngeal nerve, and this is uh, autonomic sympathetic innervation for uh, creating saliva. There are various structures that pass through the parotid, and that's going to be important when it comes to doing parotidectomies or any kind of surgery or manipulation of the parotid gland. Uh, most importantly is the facial nerve. Uh, that's usually implicated when parotid surgeries are done. The great auricular nerve branches pass through the parotid gland. There's also the external carotid artery and the superficial temporal artery are in the vicinity of the parotid gland, as well as the retromandibular vein. The lymphatic drainage, and this is going to be important when we talk about infections, the lymphatic drainage is to the cervical nodes. So the three glands, the three salivary glands are the parotid, the submandibular, and the sublingual and sublingual just meaning below the tongue. Here's the structure of the tongue here, and here's the sublingual gland. The parotid gland is drained via Stenson's duct, as mentioned. The submandibular gland is drained via Wharton's duct, and the uh, and that's going to come out below the tongue. And the, sub the sublingual gland is drained via Bartholin's duct, which then drains into Wharton's duct, and then out beneath the tongue. Parotid gland tumors can be benign or malignant. About 80% are benign, 20% are malignant, and this is specifically the parotid gland. Now, if you have a tumor in the submandibular or sublingual gland, it's more likely to be malignant than if it were in the parotid gland. So, 80, about 8 in 10 parotid gland tumors are benign, but... It's, they're more likely to be malignant if they're in the sublingual or submandibular glands. Although the majority, the vast majority, happen in the parotid gland. The depth of invasion is variable regardless of whether the tumor is benign or malignant. So that's not necessarily uh, an important marker. Of course, if it is malignant, then it's going to be important. But benign tumors can be invasive as well. Um, so both... Benign and malignant parotid tumors present as a mass. You can't tell just by looking at the, at the mass. Uh, however, pain and facial nerve palsy are very salient features of malignancy that don't tend to happen with benign tumors. You don't need to have pain and facial nerve palsy with malignancy, but if there is a mass and pain and facial nerve palsy present, then that's uh, suggestive of a malignancy. So here's a parotid gland mass, just right in that area of uh, the parotid gland, and right, right around that temporal mandibular joint area. Another one. So here's a submandibular gland mass. Um, it's it can be difficult to tell this from a sublingual gland mass. Uh, but uh, 
the best way is to know that this is just uh, these are uh, the submandibular gland masses are more on one side than the other. So here's here's a bilateral occurrence, and then here's a sublingual gland mass more at the midline. So benign parotid tumors are generally more likely to occur in middle-aged women than in men. Uh, however, there is a specific benign parotid tumor that actually is more likely to happen in men. We'll discuss that in a little bit. There's a higher incidence among Caucasians, but there's really no known risk factors for a benign parotid tumor. The symptom is simply an asymptomatic facial mass. That mass tends to be mobile, non-tender, uh, and uh, very few other symptoms are likely to be present. This is often a chronic mass. This is not a mass that's suddenly developed within the last week. That would be unusual. So this is usually something that's slow growing and the patient's often able to give you, uh, tell you that it's been around for weeks to months as opposed to days. Um, so for diagnosis, physical examination is really what's going to help you uh, get uh, down to the point that this is a benign parotid tumor. Basically, you have a mass in the parotid region, but that's not enough, of course, to di diagnose uh, a tumor. Uh, it doesn't, you, you aren't able to exclude malignancy just by that. And so you can do imaging, but a necessary step is fine needle aspiration because it's the fine needle aspiration that will uh, tell you if this is a malignancy or not. Remember what I said that with malignancies there is a tendency towards pain and facial nerve palsy uh, whereas with benign tumors we don't see that uh, but it's not always the case so you still have to do a fine needle aspiration um, and that's going to help you uh, with uh, with your operative planning to determine if it's benign or malignant. Uh, something that you'll never do is an open biopsy. So that's never the right answer. The different types of benign parotid tumors, the most common is a pleomorphic adenoma, it makes up 80%. Warthin's tumor makes up about 5%. This is more common in men than in women. Um, and then uh, you know, there's an association with Warthin's tumor with smoking, so that may be a, a reason uh, behind that. Uh, Godwin's tumor makes up 5%, and uh, then there are various others. So this isn't necessarily something you need to memorize, but pleomorphic adenoma is the most common benign parotid tumor. So what do we do for treatment? After we've done our fine needle aspiration, we've determined this is a benign parotid tumor. We've probably done some imaging, perhaps a CT or an MRI to really uh, get down where this tumor is, how deep it's invaded, how many, uh, if it's invaded the deep lobe of the parotid gland or just restricted to the superficial lobe. Uh, from there, then we can decide how much surgery we need to do. If the tumor is restricted to the superficial lobe of the parotid gland, then you may just do a lobectomy with histologically clear margins ensuring that you have removed all of the tumor. If the tumor, however, has invaded the deep lobe of the parotid gland, then the procedure of choice is a full parotidectomy. Uh, preservation of the facial nerve can be challenging, especially if you're doing a parotidectomy, and uh, so preoperative imaging is really useful uh, in assisting because you can help that helps you find where the facial nerve is traveling in the patient because everybody's different not everybody has exactly the same anatomy so when you're doing your operative planning uh, if you know uh, any kind of uh, anatomic anomalies in the patient that can help you in uh, making sure that you're not nicking the facial nerve and causing a palsy in that patient Okay, malignant parotid tumors. So 20% of parotid tumors are malignant. However, about 40 to 50% of tumors of the sublingual and submandibular uh, glands are uh, malignant. Risk factors include tobacco use, especially chewing tobacco, uh, and then exposure to iodizing radiation. 
The symptoms are classically a firm, painful, and tender mass with facial nerve palsy, weakness, but it's not always the case. So if it is a mass that is firm and tender and there's facial nerve weakness and there's pain, then it's likely malignant. But if you don't have those symptoms, that doesn't exclude malignancy. So I don't want you to think that this is one or the other. So classically, the USMLE, if they want to give you a malignant tumor, they're probably going to give you the classic firm, painful, tender, ma tender mass with facial nerve weakness. But I just want to stress that it's not always the case that a malignant tumor presents like that. Uh, you may also see an enlarged cervical node. Remember that the, the parotid gland drains to the cervical nodes. Uh, so if that is present, then you'd want to document that. For diagnosis, again, you're going to do a fine needle aspiration uh, of the mass or of an affected node if one is present. And then once you've diagnosed the malignancy, you should do imaging to uh, plan for surgery. The types of malignant parotid tumors include the mucoepidermoid carcinoma, which makes up about 50%. Uh, and then there's some other uh, tumors, the eosinic cell carcinoma, which is 17%, adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is 15%, and squamous cell carcinoma, which I addressed in another section, about 10% of tumors of the parotid gland. Treatment is based on histologic grade and depth of invasion. Certainly for the USMLE, you don't need to know how to grade these histologically, but you should know that uh, Lower grade tumors uh, are more favorable to the patient and higher grade tumors are less favorable to the patient. And you should know if it's a low grade tumor and it's confined to the superficial lobe, then you could, you, you, you may be able to just do a superficial parotid lobectomy. However, in most cases, when it's a malignant parotid tumor, you're going to need to take the entire parotid gland out on that side. That's going to be the treatment of choice. And so I would remember that. Um, if you don't remember any of these other three pointers here, just remember that with a malignant parotid tumor, most of the time, at the very least, you're going to have to take the, the entire parotid gland with the tumor out. If it's a high-grade tumor, a lot of times there's also going to be a radical neck dissection because there's concern of seeding to the nodes. And a lot of times, post-operative radiation will be administered to kill any remaining uh, cancerous cells. Okay, so moving on from neoplasms to uh, inflammation. Calculus sialadenitis is just a stone formation of stones in the salivary duct. Uh, that's sialolithiasis. And then you get an obstruction of outflow of saliva from the gland to the mouth. And most commonly, these occur in the submandibular duct. However, they can occur uh, elsewhere, uh, too. So uh, the submandibular duct is just Wharton's duct. It's the same thing. Um, so these can occur anywhere, but they most commonly occur in the submandibular duct. So you can think of this in some ways kind of like uh, cholelithiasis, in that you're getting obstruction of outflow, and then you can get an inflammation from that and pain. So the symptoms are recurrent postprandial localized pain and swelling. So think of that. You eat. When you eat, you're supposed to secrete saliva to help you uh, digest that food. And if you have a stone in your gland, then as you're trying to secrete saliva, it's going to be blocked and that's going to cause pain. So recurrent postprandial localized pain. And then swelling can happen too because the saliva gets backed up and that can inflame and disrupt the tissue. Pain may be in the face or mouth or neck or the jaw. It really is variable, uh, but there's usually some pain involved. Uh, xerostomia could be present because you're not getting sufficient amount of saliva because you have the blockage. So that's just dry mouth. So for diagnosis, I don't expect the USMLE to ask you how to diagnose this, but I do want you to know that the gold standard for diagnosing stones in the salivary duct is sialography. Uh, however, sialography is contraindicated if the patient shows signs of infection. So all sialography is is they shoot up the, uh, the, the duct uh, with 
a contrast material, and then take pictures of it. That's the gold standard. I've never personally seen it done. So personally, I would start with plain films, get a lateral and oblique jaw view. Uh, about 80% of stones are radio opaque, and so you may be able to see the stone, and that would be diagnostic if you can see the stone, uh, especially in a clinical setting that's consistent with sialadenitis. Sonography is another way that you can uh, find the stone, find the obstruction. However, the problem with sonography is that if you're not experienced at visualizing the salivary glands with sonogram, it's not going to be very useful for you. So, personally, I would start with plain films, get the lateral and oblique views. You may be able to see the stone. If you can't and you're still considering calculus sialadenitis, then you can go for sialography. But if the USMLE asks you what the best test is, the most accurate test, it's sialography. Okay, so here's why I would start out with the x-ray, because in some patients it's obvious. Here is a stone of the uh, submandibular duct. Here's more stones. Oh, no, this is the normal sialogram. Okay, so I just want to compare this. Okay, here's the normal sialogram. So this is a sialogram where they inject the contrast material. And it kind of, uh, the way the gland looks is kind of like a tree. That's sort of how it's supposed to look, like a tree without its leaves. And note that, then this is a, a negative, um, when, there's, uh, when there's a stone present, not only can you see the filling defect, but you also don't see as much contrast getting to the rest of the duct. So this is just a, a negative image of this. So you could inverse the colors and do the same thing. So the stone's right here. So a silogram, most accurate test for diagnosing calculus sialadenitis. The treatment depends on how far the stone is from the outlet of the duct and how large the stone is itself. Various treatment modalities exist, so if the stone is very close to the outlet, you can do gentle manual palpation to get the stone out. Uh, otherwise, shockwave lithotripsy can be done or silo endoscopy. And silo endoscopy is done more and more these days. Acute suppurative parotitis is a bacterial inflammation of the fascial sheath of the parotid gland. There is an increased incidence of acute suppurative parotitis in debilitated patients, patients uh, with dehydration, poor oral hygiene, or patients who have uh, a history of dry mouth. So think of patients, for instance, with Sjogren's syndrome. And the number one or organism that causes inflammation, bacterial inflammation of the parotid gland is Staph aureus. And so that's important because if the patient is a debilitated patient and they acquire parotitis while they're in the hospital, we have to make sure we're covering MRSA. So symptoms include a unilateral painful inflammation of the gland. There's often overlying erythema and then your typical inflammation symptoms, fever, constitutional symptoms. A lot of times if you look inside the patient's mouth, you can even see a purulent exudate uh, that can be noted from Stenson's or Wharton's duct. For diagnosis, uh, radiographs can be useful to differentiate out calculus sialadenitis that can, pro that can produce similar symptoms and that you're getting uh, pain in the gland. Uh, but fever and constitutional symptoms will definitely point you more towards uh, a pyogenic inflammatory problem. Otherwise, this is a clinical diagnosis that you're making here. So here's uh, an example where you can see pus in the outlet. All right, so here's uh, it is coming in from, I believe this would be Stenson's duct here. 
So what do we do to treat the patient? First, we want to try conservative measures because not all of these patients will need to go to surgery. So we try to treat the infection. What we're going to start off by doing is administering fluids and hydrating the patient since the vast majority of these patients are dehydrated to begin with. We want to make sure that we're uh, resuscitating their fluids. And then most importantly, uh, as far as the treatment of the infection goes, we have to give them IV antibiotics. Make sure you remember that Staph aureus is the number one cause of paratitis, and so you need to give anti-Staph drugs. So nafcillin, if this was acquired in the community, but if it was acquired in the hospital, you're giving vancomycin or an equivalent anti-MRSA drug uh, to uh, cover the MRSA. You can also use silagogues that can help uh, expectorate the pus and infection out of the, uh, the duct. And so something like that would be like a lemon wedge that actually causes constriction uh, of, the, uh, of the duct. And uh, so silagogue just means something that makes you salivate. So lemon wedges is what's classically used, although there's probably other things. Warm compress can be done for the pain as well as NSAIDs. Patients generally respond to the conservative management within a day. However, if they don't, if the infection fails to improve, surgical drainage will become necessary.